there, nerds. I'm Dr. Jordan Breeding, and I keep forgetting the particulars of this doctor bit because I really didn't expect to make this many appointments. So anyway, I have your results right here is the thing that I've forgotten to say a lot recently. Anyway, you're watching another episode of Your Brain on Crack, the show that's probably too transparent at times and the only show on crack where if I can take you behind the scenes for a second, under my lab coat is a moist swamp of sweat and sadness. So today I'll illuminate. <music> One of the great things about movies is they take us to other times and places, like a time when stupid little space bears could bring down an empire, or places where Nicolas Cage's head is on fire. <laughs> Unfortunately, our terrible real world can sometimes leak into these fantasy worlds and ruin everything. For instance, it's a little harder uh, enjoying Ferris Bueller's Day Off when you learn that he's being chased by a character played by a real life pedophile. The movie still works, it just seems like the stakes are suddenly really high. So here are some other behind the scenes facts that will ruin some of your other favorite films. Come on down here and smooch my big old white butt. Do you remember the pure terror you felt as those Jurassic Park velociraptors stalked those unlikable kids and threatened to shred their little child tummies? Tummy's not that different from yours, by the way. Those dinosaurs were a nightmare, too fast to outrun, too lethal to fight, too clever to trick, and they could talk to each other. With just a few grunts and honks, they could coordinate efficient child belly ripping attacks as a raptor squad. Across the belly, spilling your intestines. But you know what might have made that scene less horrifying? If you could somehow go back in time and explain to your younger self that all those honks and grunts are actually just the sounds of adorable turtles friggin' plowing each other. <laughs> Velociraptors had unfortunately died out like just before Spielberg and his team were able to record what their language sounded like. And anyone who enjoys dinosaur science, so everyone, knows that archaeologists are always changing their minds about dinosaur specifics. We used to think they roared, then we thought they maybe quacked, and apparently the sound designer of Jurassic Park decided, yeah, maybe they sound like turtles having sex. Gary first heard the beautiful haunting sounds when he was at Marine World. It was this urgent reptilian barking, perfect for the dinosaur movie he was working on. He rushed to locate the source. What could sound so intelligent yet so primal? Well, turns out it was the sound of two horny turtles banging each other instead of saying, oh, it's turtle sex. I was hoping I could find something to use for my movie. He began to record them. See the lack of humility before nature that's being displayed here. Um Staggers. I'm not gonna start another tired debate with you guys about where the line is between turtle pornography and turtle art, but regardless, it's a lot of work to make. The sound engineer claims that tortoises mating can take a long time, like you've gotta have plenty of time to sit around and watch them and record them. And I'm hoping that's true and not just an excuse he came up with for why he comes home later and later every night, but Anyway, the next time you're watching Jurassic Park and those scary raptors are speaking to each other, just picture a man sitting outside a tortoise enclosure watching them go down on each other for a very, very long time. <laughs> the Fast and the Furious series seems to be about how drag racing somehow prepares you for a life of sophisticated military operations and heists, but as any true fan knows, the series is actually about family and how familial bonds are like twin nitrous oxide bottles pouring into the Toyota Supra engine that is your life. I mean, when you're living a quarter of a mile at a time, family is the handbrake that lets you drift around crippling emotional obstacles. They've got the most important pink slip of all, the pink slip to your heart. Friggin' family, man, you get it. But what's real? His family. The first movie of that series, or what future civilizations will one day describe as the first piece of true art, introduces us to Dominic Toretto, a street racing legend played by moaning, baby-headed actor Vincent Diesel. I don't have friends. He leads a gang, no, a family, of street racers, which includes his girlfriend Michelle Rodriguez and his sister Jordana Brewster. It's no exaggeration to say that they use their fast cars and driving skills to car race every single one of their enemies to death. The only problem is, while they were filming The Fast and the Furious, those three actors might have been the three worst drivers on the planet. <laughs> Rodriguez and Brewster didn't know how to drive at all before making the movie. And badass action star and future iconic drag racing hero Vin Diesel had no clue how to drive a stick shift.
Of course, there's suspension of disbelief in every movie. I assume Russell Crowe doesn't actually have a beautiful mind in real life, but still, I would expect, say, martial arts stars to at least know how to kick a little ass. And surely actors playing a doctor at least know how to sanitize their hands. <laughs> God, it's projectile vomiting right in my eyes, and it burns. I don't think it's unfair to assume that racing superheroes could at least drive themselves and their toned asses to the set. Driving is so necessary to so many people's lives, it's almost harder to not know how to drive. Especially after your agent tells you you got a part in something called The Fast and the Furious. Did they think it was about bicycle racing, cranky competitive eating, having violent sex with turtles? That's ridiculous. Turtles have sex very slowly and over the course of many hours. And it sounds like What are we talking? What are we talking about? <laughs> The rights of animal actors have come a long way since that scientific asshole Thomas Edison filmed the electrocution of a real elephant back in 1903. And generally speaking, it's now frowned upon for filmmakers to brutally murder animals, even if it helps motivate John Wick. <laughs> I'm sorry. Animal stunts are performed by expert handlers and their well-trained best friends, which, yeah, sometimes looks like a guy just yanking a horse into the ground, but still, it's a lot more humane than shooting them, so, you know, get off my back, PETA. And besides, it would ruin the movie for everyone if we actually knew that old Yeller was shot in the face by an actual trembling child. Oh, Yeller. And yet, during the filming of Snow Buddies, a straight-to-DVD sequel to Air Bud, five puppies straight up died on set. Five. And no, it wasn't during some elaborate stunt for the final puppy fight scene, they all just managed to catch some crazy virus. The team knew that the puppies were sick, but they bravely tried to work around the dog's illnesses anyway, and when it was over, five little puppies had died for what can now be considered the darkest Disney original movie ever. I can barely stay awake. Blech. Even worse, the movie still lost like $30 million. That's like letting Gollum bite your finger off for a chance at a second breakfast. I mean, sure, there may be some joy, but... You've lost so much, it's hardly worth it. And that doesn't taste very nice, does that precious? No. You know, speaking of unhappiness and failure in Gollum, Peter Jackson's The Hobbit also managed to kill 27 animals over the course of filming the trilogy, which seems shocking considering these movies mostly look like a video game cutscene. How do you like that, the old twiddly whittlies? <laughs> you bugger. Apparently the main cause of death was neglect and poor conditions, which is sad for the obvious reason, and then sad again, because it perfectly describes the making of the films themselves. I mean, these three garbage movies are like a monument to neglect and poor conditions. By law, sex involving underage people can be depicted on screen within very specific boundaries and while heavily monitored. And by heavily monitored, I mean the underage actors and or actresses need their parents to be there, on set, watching every confused, awkward, inexperienced thrust. McLovin! <laughs> what the f For instance, because Christopher Mintz Ploss was only 17 at the time of this infamous super bad sex scene, his dear mother was forced to watch the whole thing in person. The scene is awkward enough as is, but Mintz Ploss's mom was not only there when he just pulled out a tube of lube, she has refused to talk about it with him since. It just lingers there, haunting their relationship, making them ever so slightly lean away from each other every time there's a Vaseline commercial on TV. I'm really sorry that I blocked your cock. And it's not only goofy love scenes and wacky comedies that require parents to hang around on set and watch their children pretend hump. Sometimes it's darker stuff, like rape scenes. And I'm of course talking about Game of Thrones, probably the first thing you think of when you hear the phrase rape scenes. What? No. The show had an attempted rape scene in season two involving teenage Sansa Stark, who's played by Sophie Turner, who was underage at the time. And the crazy thing about shooting that scene wasn't so much that her mom was there, I mean, she'd been watching her daughter do crazy sh for at least a year at this point, it's that it was also the day that her dad decided to make a surprise appearance on set and just be like, Oh, this is going great. Where's Sophie filming today? I'm her dad and I want to support oh God, Sophie. Sleep well. And while both of those actors handled it well, like professional turtles squirting into a sound designer's microphone, Julianne Huff had a really hard, veiny time with her mom being on set during a sex scene for Safe Haven. 
While her mom did have to be on set, there was nothing that said that the two had to lock eyes during her simulated climax, so Huff demanded that her mom stay behind her and out of her sightline while she just gave it to her co-star. Oh! 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 Uh, you scared me. I'm not sure that having your mother stare at your pumping butt cheeks makes things better, but then again, that's probably why I'm not asked to star in any Nicholas Sparks movies yet. Also, my parents just really don't like watching my butt pump. Do you think it's just a phase? I hope so. <clears throat> All right, well, looks like I spent most of this episode and the better part of three months researching turtle sex, but it's nothing I hadn't already seen on Zaboomafu, so calm down, Mom. Oh. He's hard. I guess on your way out, uh, go talk to Kathy and see if she's got some crickets or some shit, like whatever turtles eat, because I assume you're gonna go buy one after this episode, you sick bastards. <sighs> I just can't with them. Anybody know what this is? The call is death scope? It's what doctors have? Surely somebody on this entire production crew could have reminded me to put it on? Caleb, where were you, man? Jordan, I asked the same question. Jordan, where were you? Caleb, uh, help me sometime. Jordan, was it your fault? Sh Jordan, 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 T Caleb, T Jordan? King Kong is plastic, so he's out. It's Caleb, maybe. Not plastic. Not helpful. Jordan, was it your fault? That, look, there's a lot of people here. Caleb, Jordan, 